Are we live yet? It's, I, I, get ready, folks. You know, the class is always kind of um, different. Got to start doing that countdown timer. I, I want like a, I'm going to get a big light up there that says on air. That's what we need. That's what we need for the odd class. Ethan, are we on? Are we broadcasting? We are. We are on, we are on the air. Hello out there. Hello out there. We're, uh, we're just having a good time here on site, um, meeting new people, greeting new people, seeing you know, old friends again. So um, when, you are, when you feel comfortable enough and confident enough to, uh, to make it out and you're all good and protected, we got plenty of seating available in the odd class. And uh, I like calling it that, Jerry. You can continue the tradition or not after March 21, but it's just kind of a happy accident because you can stream this at westark.org slash AUD class. That's odd auditorium. But if I'm teaching it, it's definitely an odd class. You're here for the third lesson in a series that's focusing on the history of uh, really post-exilic Israel and Judah. And the reason why I'm, I'm doing this is because um, I plan on some sermons in the near future that will come from Ezra and Nehemiah. And this is the historical backdrop, and it's a, it's a blank spot for me. I, I really haven't known everything that I wanted to know about it until this study, so thank you for giving me the excuse to do this. Um, and... They have to go through a process of regathering people, reorienting them to what it means to be an assembly of people, reorienting them to what it means to be the people of God on mission in the world after a generation of being in exile and losing that connection to the city of David, Jerusalem, and to the promised land, uh, which in their case is the region of Judah. Now, tell me there's not some similarities there with what we're going to be going through in the next year or so, that we've gone through an exile of pandemic, and now we're learning what it means to come back together. It doesn't just spring together automatically. You know, there's very few things where that happens, and uh, I think even to think that Things change that quickly is a bit of a um, stretch. Next weekend, for example, uh, the government and all of its arrogance will act as if it can control time. And so they'll impose daylight savings time on all of us. This is about the only thing you're going to get me political about, okay? Because I don't like them messing with my clock. And I certainly don't want to lose an hour. I don't care, you, you're telling me you like daylight savings time. That's fine. I just want to leave it one way or the other. Just pick one and stay with it, and I'll be just fine. Now, that's, that's free complaint brought to you free of charge right now as I'm just grumbling. But you see, that happens, that we make that change in the clock, but then we all, well, for if, if you're like me, it, it takes you until the next change to really fully adjust to it, and then you have to start all over again. Things don't just spring back. We're going to see this when we look at the history, and we're going to see that um, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the, and the people in Judah are going through opposition, adjustment, changes. All of this has to come back together, and it has to come back together in the right way. Um, I have been asked about a timeline, so let's take a look at this timeline, and I hope this is helpful to you. Uh, I'm going to put this up on uh, my Facebook account later, and you will be seeing this again. But laying this out in this way, let's just take a second and look at that. What you've got is you've got a timeline period for what we're dealing with, which is from 560, the year 560 before Christ, to the year 420 before Christ. And so that middle line is graduated in decades um, and underneath, you have the leaders of the Persian Empire. Uh, Cyrus the Great begins his rule over the, 
the first part of the Persian Empire around the year 560 BC. Meanwhile, the people of um, Israel, the people of Judah, are in Babylon, and the Babylonian Empire under the, uh, the Babylonian king, Nabonidus, is still, is still in effect. So there is still a Babylonian Empire at that point. And that's that red bar there taking us up to about 539. In 539, Cyrus defeats Nabonidus at the Battle of Opus, and that is how the uh, Babylon is just assumed or consumed into, assimilated into the Persian Empire. Up above in those uh, uh, dialogue boxes, those are some of your key events in the Bible. 538, you have the Edict of Cyrus. This is where the exiles are turned loose. They're told to go back to their homeland and to repopulate those. We talked about that last week. If you want to learn more about that, go check out the YouTube from last week. I talked about the Persian Empire's approach to send people back to their homeland and why that helped them. 520 is the year that Haggai, and he gives us in Scripture, he says the second year of King Darius I, and that is 520, more or less. It's all of his prophecies take place during that year, and he encourages Zerubbabel and Joshua to rebuild the temple. They had started on it in 538. It gets opposed by 520. Haggai stir, is stirred by the Spirit of God as a prophet, and he encourages them to start rebuilding. And so uh, in March of 515, <clears throat> That's when Zerubbabel, the governor over Judah, or the king, and Joshua, the high priest, complete the building of the second temple. This is the the temple of Solomon had been destroyed. This is the second temple. Now there is a temple again in Jerusalem. This is the beginnings of the same temple that Jesus will be at, which they often call Herod's temple. And it's called Herod's temple because Herod adds on to it and he expands it. Um, this is the beginnings of it. This is the early phase of that second temple. And that period from 515 up until the, well, really up until 70 A.D. is called the second temple period in history. So if you ever come across that, um, you'll, you'll know what we're talking about there. Uh, now you have the, the, um, the, the reinstitution of the house of God, the temple of God. In Jerusalem. That's going to change things. It's going to change a lot of things. But that's the first thing you have to do. You rebuild God's house, then you rebuild God's people, and then you rebuild David's city. That's the basic outline of this time period. Uh, We're going to jump, we, we ended right around 515. That was the mission of Zerubbabel and Joshua. That was the mission of Haggai and Zechariah. By the way, those trapezoids down below I'm giving you a range more or less of of where Zechariah and maybe Esther Esther's time period is hard to ascertain exactly so and it doesn't really matter she might be part of uh, the rule of Xerxes the first it's possible that what happens in Esther could be as late as the rule of Xerxes the second uh, it's it, it doesn't affect how we understand and read the book but that's a that's a strong possibility right there, I think. And Zechariah, though, is very specific. All of his prophecies take place between 520 and 518 before Christ. We're going to skip ahead to uh, what you see over here, which is Ezra. So notice how much time has passed. We've gone from 515 to 458. That's nearly half a century, right? Maybe more than half a century. My reverse BC math doesn't work very quickly, so you have to forgive me there. But um, uh, you you look at the time gap where you you have this long period. There's There's at least, we can say this, there's at least a generation or two. The first wave has come back to Judah, or as the Persians would call, they they, they would call it um, Yehud, uh, Medinota, which is the district of Yehud, the of Judah. You've already got a generation of people back in that district. They're, they're settling in there. 
the, you've got the, the ruling class that's settling in there. You've got the temple now, so you're going to have priests. Uh, you're going to have some Levites. You're going to have some people who are making all of this operate. You've got Zerubbabel and his ruling class that are there. Judah is coming back. Jerusalem is coming back. It's not all there, but it's coming back. Meanwhile, you still have generations of God's people in Babylon because they had been there, and at this point, they've been there over a hundred years. So you have generations of God's people in Babylon. Where is that? That's, that's modern-day Iraq, okay? And, and um, uh, the Persian Empire, the, 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 the center, the capital of that, that's modern-day Iran, so you've still got generations of people, you've still got communities of people living away from Judah. The second wave is about to begin, and this morning we're going to take a look at Ezra. Uh, next week and the week after, we'll take a look at Nehemiah as we wrap this up. We talked about um, mission objectives and using the, uh, the video game, uh, you know, Levels. We've got different levels. You've got to keep moving up these levels to get this done. All right, so uh, what would your level two mission objectives be? If level one was to get the people back to Judah, what are you supposed to do in level two? You've got to restore the function of the temple. The temple's there, but what's the temple supposed to do? And is the temple doing everything that needs to be uh, done in the temple? You have to restore the identity of Judah as a chosen people. They're there. But do they know what their mission is? You've moved them in space, but have you moved them spiritually? Have you moved them in their own mindset? That's going to be Ezra's challenge. And you've got to restore the practice of the Torah. You see, in exile, the people of God had to learn how to be the people of God in a foreign land, away from their homeland, away from the promised land, away from the temple. Could you still be the people of God, without all of the things that you anticipated and expected day after day. Isn't that what we did in our pandemic exile? I mean, we had to figure out, okay, we can't get out. We can't get to the building. How do we do communion? Uh, We won't have anybody serving us communion when we're here. Does it still work? What does it really mean? And during that exile period... The people of God under their leaders, and you have prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they learn, okay, this is what it has always meant to be God's people. Ezekiel teaches the people that following laws written on tablets of stone is not nearly as important as following laws that are inscribed on our hearts. That just having it external and saying, look, we know the rules, we know what to do. That's not nearly as important as having that as something that we cherish and we shape our lives around it. They've learned that in exile. Now you've got to relearn all those lessons when you move the people back to the land of promise. Otherwise, all you've done is you've changed everybody's address. You've changed everybody's address and they're still not the people of God. This is going to be Ezekiel or Ezra's task. Uh, We've got Ezra to work with. We've also got two names that I think deserve to be mentioned, but they're not as familiar. Sherebiah and Hashabiah. And they're going to come up in the text. I just noticed them as being important figures. They're going to go with Ezra. And they do something that else in addition to support Ezra. Ezra comes as a scribe and a priest. We'll talk about that in a second. But these two individuals are going to go with Ezra on his journey, on his migration back to uh, Judah, and they're going to restore the ways of the Levites, the, the temple servants in Jerusalem. You know, you've got a temple, but who are your people that keep all of that going, that see to all that? Uh, I'll show you when they come up in the text. Ezra 7, verses 1 through 7, give us the uh, beginning of, of Ezra's mission. And um, <clears throat> just so you understand a little bit about the, out, the, the outline and the makeup of the book of Ezra, I've said this many times, you need to view Ezra and Nehemiah not as a single narrative, like here's a little novel, here's a little mini story, which this is a good moment to bring up Esther. 
Esra, or Esther, rather, Esther is definitely a once upon a time type story. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. It says, you know, we, we start out, it tells us a story about Queen Vashti, and, and then we see what happens, and then there's a, you know, it's a, it's a dramatic story. That's why we love it so much. And it tells a story. If you go into Ezra and Nehemiah expecting that, you're not going to be that satisfied. Ezra starts out with a lot of documentation and background. It's like one of those books that you read and it has a huge introduction and then it has a, a table of translations and it has all these accounting reports stuck in there. I mean, if Ezra had Excel spreadsheets, then the first few chapters would have those. So I prefer to look at Ezra as if it's a file folder and it's filled with these documents these clippings, these memos, okay? And he has this information in there because the chronology is not as important as the record of what happened so that you can understand biblically and theologically what's going on. So we need to respect Ezra for what it is, the, the book of Ezra, and likewise with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is more of a memoir, but Ezra's memoir, the story, picks up in chapter 7. Everything in chapters 1 through 6 was setting us up and giving us some context. All right, let's take a look at Ezra 7. Um, many years later, that's definitely true. You've looked at the timeline. You know what this means. This is uh, uh, many years after the, the, the restoration of the temple or the, you know, the, the new dedication of the second temple in 515 and they celebrate the Passover, things are starting. After these things, or many years later, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia. You want to go back and look at the timeline real quick? Give me some, you know, what do you think, audience? Yeah, yeah, all right, there we go. Let's do it, doot, 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 doot. There you go. Okay, you see where we're going from Darius? Then there's Artaxerxes, 458. So we're well into, Artaxerxes, by the way, starts his rule in 465. So we're uh, almost a decade into the rule of Artaxerxes. All right, we'll jump back to the text now. There we go. All right, so during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named Ezra. He was the son of Sariah, the son of, uh, and Sariah was the son of Azariah, who was the son of Hilkiah, who was the son of Shalom. S stick with me, we got to get through this. Son of Sadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzi, here comes my favorite, son of Bucky, that's a Hebrew name you can remember, son of Abishua, son of Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron the high priest. Why do we need his genealogy? Well, it tells us something. Uh, first of all, some of these names are probably familiar to you. Uh, some of them may be brand new, like Bucky. And uh, Aaron, the high priest, you remember him from earlier stories. You remember him uh, from uh, Moses, right? Yeah. Is it that Aaron? It sure is. Ezra is descended from that original high priest. But what about all these others? Well, some of them may not be as familiar to us automatically, but Zadok, for example. Uh, Zadok. This is the high priest during the rule of David and Solomon when we had the first temple. So Ezra has a lineage and he has a family history, a direct line going back to priests who were with Moses in the wilderness and priests who worked with the first temple under David and Solomon. Um, anyway, we won't spend a lot of time on this lineage, but the more you look into these individuals, some of them are mentioned in other places in Scripture, even his father, Sariah, um, in, in 2 Kings, and their significance matters. This tells us something. Okay, verse 6. <clears throat> this Ezra was a scribe, who was well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to the people of Israel. It, well, the way we would say it is that Ezra knows his Bible. He does. 
he, uh, you know, he, he's, he's got a lot of it memorized, but more than that, he knows how to use it. He has gone to some school, all right? Uh, he came up to Jerusalem from Babylon, and the king, that would be Artaxerxes, gave him everything that he asked for, because the gracious hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the people of Israel, as well as some of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants traveled up to Jerusalem with him in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes' reign. And that gives us the date 458. Some people say 457. I say, why quibble about a year? You get the idea. Um, But I think 458 is a good date to to fix this on. If you want to think it's 457, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, and neither should you. Anyway, here's where we're going then. Look at the journey they have to take. It's, It's this second wave now of people migrating from Babylon to Jerusalem. They're going up around the river. They're going along the Euphrates River. Remember that Persia calls that district over there where uh, Judah and, uh, and Israel, uh, Samaria is over here. They call this the region or the satrapy of trans-Euphrates. It's everything on that side, on the other side of the Euphrates. So that's the Persian perspective on that. And when you see that term uh, show up in your Bible, it'll either say trans-Euphrates or it'll say the Ebernari. That's that region that they're talking about. Somebody's got to take care of that because, you know, the, 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 the king and his people right there, I mean, they've got this huge empire. They can't be worried about it over here in Persepolis and Susa, what's going on. So they have, they have uh, middlemen to take care of it all. Artaxerxes according to Ezra's documents, is not only involved in this migration, he is motivated and moved by God. So, in Artaxerxes' own words, Ezra includes a letter from Artaxerxes. Starts off in uh, verse 11. Uh, Ezra says, This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, and now let's stop right there, you're wait, wait, king of kings, yeah, yeah, don't we have that over here, we do, king of kings is one of the titles of the Persian emperor, king of kings means that he's the king over the other kings, when we pick up that title in history and then we apply it to Jesus, we are making a statement that Jesus is an authority over all other governments and rulers. We need to keep that in mind. I think that's important to our um, view of things. Otherwise, if Jesus is just another authority, another option along with everybody else, and he has a seat or a table at the United Nations or whatever religious council just like everybody else, then do we really understand Christ? I don't think so. I mean, we need to pick this up. Artaxerxes is the one in charge of the known world for these people. Um, He is over all the other rulers in those districts. So when Ezra brings this letter out, he says, look, just because the governor of Samaria has a problem with what we're doing in Judah, you need to understand that up the chain, the king of your king said that we're good to do this. Now, When we go to Jesus and we talk about King of Kings, we're even saying more, but we'll save that for another time. Here's Artaxerxes. He writes a letter to Ezra, gives him a document. He says, "Uh, Greetings. Now I decree that any of the people of Israel in my kingdom, including the priests and Levites, may volunteer to return to Jerusalem with you. I and my council of seven hereby instruct you to conduct an inquiry into the situation in Judah and Jerusalem based on your God's law, which is in your hand. We also commission you to take with you silver and gold, which we are freely presenting as an offering to the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem. And that's just the beginning of it, and it goes on. But a few things we can see already. The king is not only moved by God to invest, and I mean in every way invest, in this project. Uh, he and his counselors have determined that it's good that if Judah's going to exist, Judah needs to be the best Judah that it can be. It can be the Judah that God intends 
for Judah to be. And so, who would you send to develop the identity of this people other than someone who is educated and well-versed in the law of God and God's way? So Ezra many times is described as a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord. You want to continue, you want to get this Judah up and running the way it's supposed to be, so Artaxerxes is going to trust in Ezra, because Ezra's probably been doing that with the exiles, and his father was doing that before him, so now we want to take what he's doing in Babylon and move it over to Jerusalem. Now, Artaxerxes is also funding this project, and that's important for a lot of reasons. One of the things that you can uh, either appreciate or just understand about the Persians are they are bureaucrats. I mean, they have, they have, they're the kind of people that have receipts for everything. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of little, and, we, and that's great for us in archaeology too because we, we turn up all these little clay documents, cuneiform and all that, and you know, it's just a bunch of uh, financial records, but it tells us a few things. So Artaxerxes is funding this project, and the reason he's funding this project is that he has confidence in Ezra. Ezra is described as a scribe and a priest, and it might be real easy for us to gloss over that. Scribe and a priest. You know, we, we hear about that, and again, going to the, the, the time period of Jesus, we hear about the scribes and the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law. Well, Ezra is the prototype for what that is. And this is something that we haven't really encountered yet in Jewish history. If you think about it, before Ezra, what do we have? We have patriarchs. We have people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And one of the things about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is they're, they're nomadic men. They're, 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 it's a, you know, a father-led kind of a tribe. And they have this relationship with God where they're really trying to figure things out. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do not have a copy of the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? Did you know that? You know why they don't have a copy of the Ten Commandments? It hasn't been written yet. But they have this relationship with God. And quite honestly, they they fumble a lot. I mean, let's, let's, let's be clear. They do this. And... And yet there's no excuse for that. I mean, there's no excusing it to where the Scripture says, oh, we need to clean up the image and make sure that Abraham, you know, we we need to uh, put a gold halo on him and everything. No, because God is the hero of the story, and God is saying, I can work with this Abraham. I can work with this Isaac. And then in a really great way, he says, you know what? The people's choice would have been Esau. I'm going with Jacob. It's like, are you kidding? Jacob? God, do you really know what you're doing? Yeah, I got this. Trust me, because I don't need them as much as they need me. And so he works with these individuals, and that's where we get our tribes. Then you have a a leader like Moses. Uh, Moses is a unique kind of a leader. He's sort of the prototype of the prophets. And his brother Aaron becomes the prototype of the priests. And that's where we see a lot of this form. Now we've got a Ten Commandments. Now we have to create a new identity because these people have come out of slavery. They have no identity of their own. We have to teach them what it means to be the people of God. You know, if you asked your uh, everyday Israelite, you know, one of the, I mean, they're called the children of Israel. Israel is Jacob's other name. That's their only identity is, hey, we're all those folks that are descended from Jacob. If you take them straight out of Egypt and you take them into the desert and set them up in a new place, They're going to go around the room and say, you know what, we can start a new uh, uh, civilization here. Let's uh, figure out what everybody can do. Uh, First of all, is anybody a brick maker? Every hand in the room goes up. Do we have anything else? Nope. Okay, we got some work to do. So first you have to have a whole generation of training and wandering around in the desert to get these people from going from just brick makers to something that's going to really fulfill the mission of God. So we've got some education there. You end up with other prophets along the way. You end up with a king with, uh, you know, after Samuel, who's that spiritual leader in the same tradition, in the same mold as Moses, 
People decide, you know what, we need a king. Other people have got kings. We need this king. Uh, he's going to protect us. He's going to defend us. He's going to be a political leader. We want a king. They get Saul. That doesn't work out so well. God says, all right, I'll give them a king because I should really be their only king, but I'm going to give them David. David, that seems to work. David's son Solomon, they take them in new directions. But there's a downside to it. There's always a downside to it, and God warned them about it. And so you know, he told them, he said, look, you're going you're gonna to not like this king on certain days, even though it sounds like a really good idea right now. So now we have all of these different leadership types. You've got patriarchs. You've got, you know, and by the way, the patriarchs later on don't just go away. Uh, it's just because you have prophets doesn't mean that we say we don't need any patriarchs. I mean, doesn't the community of Israel always have elders? It has that tradition of having the older ones, the family heads. It just gets kind of used in a different direction, in a different way. There's a development there. Even after the kings, even after the dynasty of David and uh, Solomon, you end up with other kings and you end up with governors and other rulers that are ruling within this new political structure. But with Ezra, other than his priestly duty, we have something new. We have the scribe. The scribe is more than just a Bible teacher or someone who copies Scripture. Ezra has it as his focus, and I'm not saying Ezra's the first scribe, but he's the first one that we come across here, but he really establishes the tradition of looking at the Word to determine what it is that God wants to do. When you get to 458 B.C., when you get to Ezra's time period, there is now a collection of sacred Scripture that needs to be dealt with, read, studied, and understand. Ezra is the keeper of traditions that have now been put into writing. A lot of that happened during the exile. And so Ezra is part of that tradition of the people keeping this in writing. If you can't take your temple with you into exile, if you can't take your king and your promised land with you into exile, what do you have? You have your story. You have, your, you have God's words. And you can put those on paper. You can keep those with you. So Ezra and his uh, community, his, his colleagues, are very much dedicated to keeping that Word of God alive and accurate and meaningful. He's an expert on what this means. They're trying to understand that history and that command. And then it's because of Ezra that a lot of our Hebrew Bible looks the way it does. You have what's called the Torah. And the Torah is a way of describing the, the core texts. We, we kind of look at the Bible in a flat way. The Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. You have the Torah, you have the prophets, and then you have the other writings that come about. In fact, you know when, when Jesus will say not one part of the law and the prophets will go away, he's talking about the Torah and the writings of the prophets. Those become important. Now, the other writings are things like Ezra and Nehemiah and the book of Esther, these other sacred texts that come along later. But the law and prophets are, are sort of the foundation stones for this Hebrew Bible. Uh, Ezra, then, is the one that we see who introduces a new way of understanding what it becomes to, or, or let me say not a new way, but the primary way of understanding what it means to be God's people. And Ezra is going to be the, uh, the prototype and the example for, even in the time of Jesus, the rabbis, the Pharisees even. I mean, the Pharisees are dedicated to a noble task. They are trying to determine what it means to be God's people, and they're looking at Scripture to do that. That is a noble task. Unfortunately, as Jesus points out, especially in Matthew 23, they're straining at gnats and swallowing camels. They're looking at the fine details and neglecting the more important stuff. Now, in addition to being a scribe, and by the way, many people think that Ezra wrote the First and Second Chronicles. And that's a, I think that's a, a very likely possibility. Again, if you tell me that somebody else wrote it, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, and neither should you. But, you know, it, it could have been, it very well could have been Ezra or somebody like him who wants to 
record this history again for a people who need to know their story, who need to understand it. And there's going to be some, some ways of telling that story that's going to be meaningful to them in their current situation. Now, he's a priest. We talked about his, his ancestry with Aaron and Zadok. So he can fulfill that role of the spiritual leader, but also as the expert in Scripture. Now, the one thing that he doesn't have with him as he prepares his group for his expedition, you know, he has to take along all the experts, the one thing he doesn't really have are people who know what to do in the temple when they get there. So we need some Levites. Uh, In chapter, uh, this I didn't put the reference on there, but in uh, chapter 8, verse 15, He's assembling his expedition at the Ahava Canal, which is it's in Babylon or right next to Babylon. And he's got them there prepared to go on this journey, which, by the way, if you're interested in this kind of thing, when you look at that map, it's going to take them five months to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem. So um, that's, the, that's the best speed you can make in the 5th century B.C. when you're traveling from Babylon to Jerusalem. They, um, they assemble at this canal. They're camping there for three days. And he goes over the lists of the people and the priests who had arrived. See, he's a scribe. He's good at this kind of stuff. He likes his list. I found out that not one Levite had volunteered to come along. And that concerns him because he, he needs to bring them over there because he knows there's a temple over there. So when he checked, uh, he found this out. And I've... Uh, I've, I've re- redacted the text there a little bit, but he summons, again, there's names that come up, Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, uh, Elnathan, again, these are names that sound very much like, and by the way, there's a, there's a Zechariah mentioned there. Is this the Zechariah of 520 to 518? Don't know. It could be. He'd be very old, but it may just be another Zechariah. Anyway, when he can't uh, get Levites, He says, this is that second paragraph, I sent them to Edo. And Zechariah is mentioned as a relative of Edo. This is a connection to the Levites, that tribe of the old 12 tribes. And Edo is the leader of the Levites at Kasifia. And I asked him and his relatives and the temple servants to send us ministers for the temple of God at Jerusalem. Since the gracious hand of our God was on us, they sent a man named Sherebiah, and he has a group that comes with him, and they also sent Hashabiah. That's why I mentioned these two, because they come along out of the Levitical tribe. By the way, the Levites are doing stuff in Babylon. Notice that there's this place where they're working in uh, Kasifia. There, there's something going on there. But Ezra's saying we really need to do this back at Jerusalem, Okay. So he gets these, these, um, these Levitical teachers, these people to restore the function of the Levites. And they, uh, the temple servants were assistants to the Levites, and you have a group of temple workers, so you have this you know, structure. A guy like Ezra knows that history. He's a priest in addition to being a scribe. So he has a list of them. They get there to the Ahava Canal, and here's their moment of faith. I gave orders for all of us to fast and humble ourselves before our God. We prayed that he would give us a safe journey and protect us, our children and our God's, uh, our goods. Boy, that would be a problem, wouldn't it, if it was God's. And our goods as we traveled. Forgive my eyesight. Um, the, um, The reason they do that is that King Artaxerxes is offering Ezra military protection to go. But Ezra determines that that's not right. Why wouldn't it be correct, Ezra? I mean, you know, there's people out there that mean you harm. Well, again, he knows the history of his people. And he knows that some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. So he says the proper thing to do here is if we're going to really do this, this cannot be a Persian military mission. This has to be a faith journey, just like Moses and the people who left Egypt. They didn't have an Egyptian army backing them up. They didn't have an Israelite army backing them up. It was them and God. And if they're really going to do this, 
then they have to do it the right way. Otherwise, if it doesn't begin that way, it's just going to be a Persian military operation. So, but they take it seriously, and they do a lot of fasting, and they do a lot of praying, because it's still quite a scary mission. I'm going to save this for next week, but I want to give you a preview of what's coming up. Um, when they get there, when they get to Jerusalem, and this second wave of Judeans who are coming from Babylon and they arrive in Jerusalem, they find out that the first wave who had come in with Zerubbabel and Joshua, that, and, and this, is, this is not so much a judgment on their part, but they find out that this first wave was doing exactly what the other people in the region and the district had been doing, just like the Samaritans. They're, they're all over there. They're in this new land. They're meeting and marrying, and they're, they're you know, the, the, the people are, they're, they're just, it's a melting pot. That's why we would say it in America. It's a melting pot. Now, from an American point of view, melting pot is a good thing, you know. I don't know. It might be not a good thing anymore. I don't know what's I, I don't know if that's supposed to be or not. But for their standpoint, there is a problem. And we can go into this in more detail next week. I will tell you this, and this is both frustrating and exciting. Ezra chapter 9 and 10, I struggle with it. I struggle with it because on one level it sounds like, you ready for this? It sounds like racism and it sounds like nationalism. Now, if you want me to pull a switch and say, oh, no, 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 it's not racism and nationalism. Very, I'm not going to do that. I think we need to struggle with it. I think we need to wrestle with it. Uh, now, let me be clear. Racism and that kind of nationalism are really bad. Okay, They're not good. We don't want any of that. But there's something else going on here in Ezra. And it sounds like those kind of things. And if people twist Scripture, they can make it sound like that. But there's a problem here that they're faced with that they didn't know they were going to have. And what you see in 9 and 10 is you see Ezra lament. He's saying this, is, this, this isn't what we expected. I mean, they expected to get over there to the first wave, and they're thinking that these people in Jerusalem who now have this new temple, they're thinking it's going to be a golden age. These people, it's going to be like just going back in time, and we're going to meet the, the original generations of people. Oh, just like the golden days when they followed God, and you had David and Solomon, and they get over there, and they're like, oh, my goodness, these people are even less the children of God than we are. Now what are we going to do? And it's a crisis, and it's a struggle. God's going to get them through it, but there's going to be some difficulties in this. Uh, one of the things you can struggle with, too, as you read that is, is they come up with a covenant to divorce. Is that right? Are you supposed to do that? That doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound like Jesus. Um, I'll give you another point of view on this as well. Some people claim that Ezra wrote Malachi. I, again, that's possible. Uh, yeah, it could make sense. If, if he didn't write Malachi, and I'm willing to believe he didn't really on that one, uh, well, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, and neither should you, because the, the message still stands. But this level two victory that we have, it's a very difficult victory, and Ezra ends on this point that they end up in this situation where families are broken apart. And like I said, We'll pick up more on that next week. I'm ready to get past that and go over and watch Nehemiah build a wall. But we got to deal with this because if we don't, <laughs> we're not going to understand that. By the way, one of the things I'll leave you with as an encouragement, you read Ezra 9 and 10 until next week, okay, and, and, and go over it and read whatever you want about it. Scripture never comes right out and just says, hey, you know what, we're going to make things real easy and simple for you and you're not going to have any problems at all. No, it's challenging. And what you see with Ezra, what you see with the people is they are challenged to do the right thing. And it can be very challenging. Now, what does that mean for us? That's where we have to do the work just like Ezra did. I appreciate your attention this morning. Thank you for your time. If you're online, please join us in 15 minutes for worship. Thank you, everyone.